Well, hallelujah. hallelujah. Father, we praise you and give you honor and give you glory. Thank you for Jesus and what he means to us. Thank you for goodness and mercy following us every day of our lives. We bless you and praise you. Thank you for the anointing. Hallelujah. Yes, the left side of someone's back that you injured even today is being healed. Whoever you are, you're going to find the pain on the left side of your back is leaving you right now in Jesus' name. Who is that person? Wave your hand at me. The pain's going out of the left side right now. Is it you? Is it you? Praise God. Hallelujah. Give praise to the Lord. Young man over there. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Pastor Debbie, thank you. You, you gave that just like I wrote it. God bless you. You can be seated. <laughs> oh, Lord. Tomorrow night, Katie, bar the door. That's an old phrase. I don't know what it means, but uh, pastor said, Brother Hagin used to say, we're going to let Tom out of the bag. I, I don't know what that means either. What was he doing in the bag in the first place? Uh, I guess the better way to describe it is a Holy Ghost blowout. Now, I understand that. Holy Ghost blowout. Praise God. Well, what a wonderful time this has been for me. I don't know how you feel, but I like it. <laughs> I'm having a great time because I feel like I'm impacting your life, and that's, that's what fulfills me. Praise God. I can imagine what Jesus must have felt like in places where he was able to, to perform miracles as opposed to when he went somewhere where, you know, uh, they didn't receive him. And so I thank God for a place like this. Praise God. And so tonight is uh, the second part from this morning. If you were here, you know what I'm talking about. If you, if you weren't here, uh, then this morning was the first part of Seed, seed Faith Part 1. And tonight is Seed Faith Part 2. So get your... Get your tablets out, get your smartphone, get your dumb phone, <laughs> take out your pad, your pencil, and uh, make some notes uh, tonight, and I pray that something that I share tonight will be a blessing to you. Did you hear the story about the $100 bill and the conversation with the dollar bill? The dollar bill said to the $100 bill, where have you been? And the $100 bill replied, why, I've been to Los Angeles, I've been to New York, I've been to Paris, I've been to Rome. I've been to London. And the $100 bill said to the dollar bill, where have you been? And the dollar bill replied, I've been to church. <laughs> this man was, uh, two, two men crashed their little airplane and uh, on a remote desert island in the middle of the ocean. And uh, their lives were spared, but the aircraft was destroyed. And they started walking around, looking around, and saw that there was, there was nothing to eat. And there was no fresh water, no animals to kill. And one looked at the other and said, uh, we're not going to make it. We're out of the shipping lanes. No ship's going to pick us up. We have no communications, no radio, no phone. There's no food, and there's no water, fresh water. And we're going to die. And his friend said, no. No, we're not going to die. I make $100,000 a week, and we're not going to die. And his friend said, yeah, you don't understand. There's nothing to eat. There's no fresh water. And uh, no one's going to pick us up out here. We're going to die. He said, no, we're not. Uh, I make $100,000 a week. He said, you don't really understand what I'm talking about. It's over for us. We're not on the regular shipping lanes. No ship's going to pass by here. We're out in the middle of nowhere. There's no food. There's no fresh water. We're not going to make it. He said, no, I'm a Christian. I make $100,000 a week. Believe me, my pastor will find me.
my dad had a way of making every day his day. Didn't matter if it was a Monday or Wednesday or whatever, Saturday, Sunday, it was his day. And if he phoned, uh, I went running. And it was not unusual for him on a weekend uh, to call and say, what are you up to? Can you come up to the house? Well, I knew that wasn't for a five-minute excursion. I, I knew I was going to be there for a few hours. And on one Saturday morning, he called and said, can you come up? And we went up, I went up, and uh, we began to uh, do some talking and praying and planning and looking ahead. Uh, and uh, we were in his little den, which he used as kind of an office where he liked to write his books. We are sitting there when all of a sudden his phone rang. And it was before there were speaker phones or anything like that. He answered it. And it was our friend Charlie. And uh, uh, I heard, I was sitting close enough that I could hear the conversation. I leaned over and my dad kind of held the phone out to where I could hear it as well. And Charlie said, I'm in trouble, Oral. I'm in trouble. Charlie was a car dealer and had done very well in his life and in his business. Uh, but he said, I'm in real trouble, Oral. I need help. I'm not selling any cars. My business is about to go under. It's been this way for quite some time. And it's just gone down. We're not selling cars. We're not selling vans. And uh, my payments are coming due. And uh, it doesn't look like I'm going to make it. And I'm in real trouble. I need help. And uh, my, my dad said, well, Charlie, are you a seed planter? And Charlie said, uh, Oral, I don't think you heard what I said. I'm in trouble. I'm in trouble. I got to have some money. I'm in trouble. And my dad said, well, Charlie, are you a seed planter? And Charlie said, Oral, I don't think you're listening to me. I'm in, real, I'm in a real jam. I got to have some help. And my dad said, well, Charlie, are you a seed planter? And Charlie said, Oral, what are you trying to say to me? And he began to preach to Charlie about planting seed and expecting God to use it for his glory and multiply it back. And after a few minutes, Charlie said, well, Oral, okay, I, uh, I give in the offering. You know, I, I, I go to church every Sunday, and I, I give in the offering. I give something. That's not always big, but I give something, you know. And uh, my dad said, well, Charlie, have you considered planting a, a significant seed unto God and focusing it, believing that God will use it and then multiply it back and bring your business out of this situation. He said, well, Oral, I've, I've never done anything like that in my life. And he said, well, don't you think now would be a good time to try? Charlie said, well, you know, I, I, I've spent about all the money that I have in the business. I put all my own personal money in it. And it looks like the whole thing's going under and, and what I have saved for my kids is gone. And it looks like it's, it's all going under. And he said, but I do have a rainy day account over here on the side and I've got some money in it. And he said, well, would you consider planting some of that as a seed unto God and letting me pray with you that God will take that seed and use it and multiply it back and begin to meet your needs in the business? And Charlie said, well, I guess I could do that. Who should I give it to? And my dad said, well, why don't you give it where you feel led of the Lord to give it? And he said, well, how about if I just give it to you, to your ministry? He said, well, you don't have to do that, but if that's what you want to do, that's fine. But sow it somewhere where the work of the Lord's being done. And Charlie said, well, okay, I'll send a check over tomorrow. So the conversation ended. I heard most of it because I was sitting right next to my dad. And uh, so we just smiled at each other and didn't make much comment. But the next day, a, a nice, sizable check came in uh, to our ministry. And a few weeks passed. And it was a Saturday again. I got that same phone call. Richard, can you come up to the house? So I, I went up and we started spending some time in prayer. And uh, we started talking about the future and plans and dreams that we had. And right in the middle of the conversation, the phone rang again. And it was Charlie. And I leaned over. My dad said, hello, Charlie. Well, I knew what that meant. So I got over close so I could listen to it again. <laughs> and Charlie was on top of the world. He said, Oral, when I planted that seed, something happened. Cars and vans started selling. And my whole business has turned around. I'm not going to lose it. I'm getting the money back that, that's personal for my family. And he said, hey, this seed faith stuff really works. <laughs> and my dad said, well, Charlie, think if you made a lifestyle of it. Not just, not just when you're in trouble, but a lifestyle. Everybody say a lifestyle. Uh, there are three key principles that I want to share with you tonight. 
I touched on it just briefly this morning. And I was reminded of it again last night as uh, Pastor Jeff asked me to autograph one of my dad's old books, uh, The Miracle of Seed Faith, the book I told you that I, I, I typed. My, I typed the manuscript myself. Here are the three principles. Number one, God is your source. Write that down. God is your source. Number two, plant your seed. Plant your seed. And number three, expect a miracle. God is your source. Plant your seed. Expect a miracle. Those are the three key principles that God gave my father concerning sowing and reaping. Everybody say, God is my source. God is my source. Plant my seed. Expect my, miracle. Expect my miracle. Let's take them one at a time. God is my source. Your banker is not your source. Your government is not your source. You have social security, that is not your source. Your job is not your source. Your ministry is not your source. Your family is not your source. God is your source. God Almighty who owns everything. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. God owns it all. You say, well, it's in the wrong hands. Well, that's not God's fault. That's our fault. Because we've allowed it to slip right through our fingers. God is our source. We look to Him. Years ago, I was uh, in a conference, in a convention in Washington, D.C., and I was sought out by the president of the African nation of Uganda, President Museveni. And he was changing his medical school in Kampala, the capital, from the British system over to the American system. And he came to me as president of the university asking me if I could help him to get American standard medical textbooks that were up to date. And I said, yes, Mr. President, I can help you. I can get several hundred of them, and I can send them to you. And he was so grateful because they were switching over from the British system to the American system. And so I said, I'll send them to you just as soon as I get back home. And he thanked me. And I said, now, Mr. President, there's something that I want from you. And he said, how can I help you? I said, the Lord has spoken to me and told me that the day would come when I would come to Uganda for a healing crusade. And I would like to have a presidential invitation. In those days, I would not go to a nation unless I was invited by the president. Because that cut through all the red tape, all the bureaucracy, all the bribery and everything else that goes on. You know what I'm talking about, Pastor Ike. And he smiled and said, Dr. Roberts, I am issuing you a presidential invitation to come to Uganda for a healing crusade. And uh, so we sent the textbooks, and the following year I went to Uganda, and the president paid for my hotel, and he gave me his presidential limousine and his secret service to surround me, and he gave me the, the grounds on which we had our crusade, and we had thirty to 40,000 people a night for a week. And thousands and thousands of people gave their hearts to Christ, and there were many, many great healing miracles. While I was there, I was hosted by his number two in command, a man by the name of Balaki Kiria, who was our equivalent to the Secretary of State. And Mr. Kiria was a Baptist preacher. He and President Museveni had been imprisoned by the wicked dictator Idi Amin. And uh, when Idi Amin had to flee the country, uh, Museveni and uh, Kiria were released from prison, and because they were so popular, Museveni was elected the next president served for many, many years as president. And during the crusade, we had a day off where there was no pastor's meeting in the morning, and, and uh, we had the time off until the service that evening. And he said to me, Dr. Roberts, would you like to see the headwaters of the Nile River? Well, I'm a studier of geography and history, and I, I love things like that. And I knew, I knew that the Nile River had its source at the Lake Victoria. 
which is only about 30 kilometers or so outside the city of Kampala. So I said, I would love to see it. So we got in the presidential limousine and we drove out to Lake Victoria where the mighty Nile River is formed. Now this is one of the great rivers in the world. And unlike most rivers, it does not flow from north to south. The Nile flows from south to north. It flows all the way from Uganda up through Africa, up through Egypt, and it empties into the Mediterranean Sea. And I wanted to see it. I mean, what a lifetime chance to see the source of the Nile River. And so we got there, and it was nothing but a little tiny trickle. And I can tell you honestly, I stepped over the Nile River. That's how small it was. I could just step over the Nile River. And I'm standing there looking at it, and Mr. Curie said to me, Dr. Roberts, what do you suppose would happen if we just built a little dam right here and we stopped the flow of this water? And before I could answer, he said, let me tell you what will happen. Millions of people would be affected. Lives would be lost. Industry would be shut down. The hydroelectric plants all the way up this mighty river would be shut down. People's lives would be affected forever. And I thought to myself, what happens when a person is cut off from their source? God is your source. He's the source of your total supply. He's got to be the center, the source of your life. And that's the first principle. You make Him the source of your life. You don't look to people. People make lousy sources. People are instruments. You don't look to people. You look to God. And God will choose the instrument that He wants to use. So number one, God is your source. Number two, plant your seed. Your seed does not grow in the barn. It does not grow in the barn in your hand. Seed has got to get down into the dirt. Scientists cannot fully explain, even today in this world of uh, technological advances, they cannot fully explain how a seed must go into the ground and die and change its nature in order to grow. It is a miracle. You take a little seed and you dig a little hole and you put the seed in the ground and you cover it over with dirt and you add some water and you step back and something miraculous begins to happen. The first thing that happens is the dirt begins to talk. And the dirt says, hello seed. I'm up here and you're down there. I weigh more than you, and you're never coming through me. But something about God in that little seed causes the seed to begin to talk. And the seed begins to say, the life of God, <laughs> the miracle life of God is in me. I have no worries. I have no frets. And the dirt says, shut up. I'm bigger than you. I weigh 400 times more than you, and you're never coming through me. But something about God in that seed causes those little tender green shoots to come through the dirt. And while the dirt's having a nervous breakdown, <laughs> the seed is beginning to grow. There's only one thing that can stop your seed. It's your mouth. You can pour gasoline on your seed with your mouth. What you say when you sow your seed is so critically important. You plant your seed and you say, well, I, I wonder. I wonder if this really, really is God. I wonder if it works. Especially when you sow your seed and immediately all hell breaks loose against you. Because Satan comes immediately to steal the seed and to tell you, shut up, this will never work. And your mouth, your cotton-picking mouth, you can tell where I'm from, your cotton-picking mouth defeats you until you have canceled your seed. You have poured gasoline on your seed. 
Remember that Jesus said, Whosoever shall say, say what? Say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he says. Well, don't stop there. Go back to Matthew 17, 20, when he, when he said, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, that is a seed that you yeah. will sow. Yeah. And if you will sow it, then you can speak to your mountain, your problem, your need, whatever it is. And you can command it to be removed and cast into the sea, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. And what kills it is a little thing called your mouth. Many a seed has been destroyed because of people's mouths. It's a good time to close your mouth. Remember he also said what things soever you desire when you pray, believe. Don't put a comma there. When you pray, believe. Not when you pray. <laughs> and talk. And then believe. No. When you pray, believe. Everybody say, when I pray, believe. In other words, they go together. Right in the middle of your praying, that's when you believe. Right in the middle of your prayer. You don't wait till your prayer is over. In the middle of your prayer. What things so you ever do desire. When you pray, believe. When you pray, believe. Say it. When I pray, believe. That's how Lindsay and I launched into the healing ministry. I gave you that testimony the other night. When we prayed, we believed. We didn't say, I wonder. You know, there's a Christmas song that I just hate. It's called, I Wonder As I Wonder. You ever heard that song? I hate that song. I wonder as I wander out under the sky. I mean, what a dumb song. I'm not out there wondering and wondering. I know where I'm going. Now, I may not know the exact route. God has the route, but I know where I'm going. Turn to your neighbor and say, I know where I'm going. And if you don't know where you're going, you've come to a mighty good place to find out. Here is spirit of faith. You've got to plant your seed. There is, no, there is no substitute for planting your seed. Tomorrow night, I'm going to share the story of how they elected me as the second president of the university and marched me down the aisle and acclaimed me by acclamation as president and hung the medallion around my neck and handed me the $60 million debt. I'm going to tell that story tomorrow night and how I got out of it by planting seed. You don't want to miss tomorrow night because all of heaven is going to break loose tomorrow night. I learned how to plant my seed. My parents poured that into me. And I poured that into my children. I can remember when our youngest, Chloe, Pastor Jay and Debbie know, uh, when she would come and she would tape a dime to a little card and she'd write on it, this is my tide. <laughs> T-I-D-E. She couldn't spell tide, but she spelled tide. This is my tide. But she got it. She might not have been able to spell it, but she got it. Amen. A lot of people can spell it, but they don't get it. Come on. <laughs> Plant your seed. God is your source. Plant your seed. Number three, expect a miracle. You've got to believe. Now, we've all, as Christians, we've all, especially charismatic Pentecostal Christians, we've heard that phrase, expect a miracle, all of our Christian lives. Everyone's heard that phrase, expect a miracle. But would you like to know the rest of the story? Yes, of where that came from? Because yes, that phrase was first spoken by my father. It was in the early 1950s. I was just a boy. And he stretched his tent in Miami, Florida for a crusade. And there was a group of atheists who came against him. And they vowed to destroy the meeting and, if possible, burn the tent down. 
and to perform what they called in those days a citizen's arrest upon my father. And they prevailed upon the city to force my father to stand before a Miami district judge and swear under oath that he did not have some type of electric device up his sleeve when he prayed for the sick. Now, this is in America. And they said, well, we will arrest you on a charge of practicing medicine without a license. And my father was very concerned because if they were successful, even though they couldn't make the charges stick, the media would pick it up. And it would go all over the world that Oral Roberts had been arrested and many people would have believed the wrong story. And he was very, very concerned about it. And this was the night that they said they were coming. Now, he had a custom uh, when we had a crusade. He would rent two hotel rooms with an adjoining door. And about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the day of a crusade, he would shut himself off in one room, and we children and my mother would go into the other room, and we had to be quiet because Daddy was studying and praying. And he would take a brief nap and then get his Bible and begin to pray and study and prepare himself for the service that night. And as he told me the story, he was asleep when he felt a hand touch him on his shoulder. He thought it was my mother. My mother wasn't there. He was aware that it was the hand of the Lord that touched him. And the voice said, sit up on the bed. And he sat up on the bed. And the voice of the Lord said, Earl Roberts, expect a miracle. That's where it started. And that night, he preached a message entitled, Expect a Miracle. And that phrase caught on went all over the world. That's how it started. But that's not all the Lord said to him. The Lord also said that night, Oral Roberts, expect a new miracle every day. Turn to your neighbor and say, expect a new miracle every day. That's not just a miracle somewhere out in the wild blue yonder. Maybe someday, somehow. But to focus and to expect a miracle every day. God is my source. Plant my seed. Expect a miracle. Because it's God's desire for you to be blessed. Third John 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. As I grew up, many Christians did not believe that it was God's will for you to prosper. Their idea was if God would keep you humble, the people would keep you poor. And they drove around clunker cars with bumper stickers saying, honk if you love Jesus. turns my stomach. How about you? God is not against you having things. He just doesn't want those things to have you. He wants his people to prosper. He said it. I wish above all things that you prosper. You can't expect it to mean anything else but that. He wants you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. That means every area of your life, God wants you to prosper. Yes. But he must have something to work with. Because yes. if you give him nothing, and he uses it and multiplies it, you still got nothing. Because yes. zero multiplied by zero equals zero. Yes. I want to talk to you for a few minutes tonight on the subject, the laws of the harvest. The laws of the harvest. Reaping from what you sow. The Bible says in 3 verse 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all your increase. That's talking about sowing and sowing first. That's talking about giving and giving your best. Not reaching down, like I said this morning, off the bottom and taking something that you won't miss, but instead reaching off the top and giving him your best. 
and then asking him for his best. He said he would multiply it back to some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. And in Deuteronomy, he said, I'll make you a thousand times more. So let me give you some things tonight for you to consider. Reasons to sow. Seven reasons tonight for you to sow and to sow your best, expecting his best. Number one, we sow to honor our creator. Write that down. We sow to honor our creator. Matthew 22, 21. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, and unto God that which is God's. They were trying to trap Jesus that day. They all hated the Roman government. They all hated paying taxes to Rome. And when they said, is it lawful under the law of Moses for us to pay taxes to the Roman government? Jesus knew they were trying to trap him so they could arrest him. And he said, give me a coin. And he said to them, whose picture is on it? Caesar's. Yes, then give unto Caesar what's Caesar's. Give unto the world what's the world's. But give unto God what is God's. You sow to honor your creator. And Psalm 24 says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Number two, you plant your seed to acknowledge your heritage. You acknowledge your heritage. Galatians 3, 29. If ye be Christ's, then ye are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I shared this morning the story of Abraham who established the tithing principle. When Melchizedek came to him and said, Abraham is blessed of the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, and the one who delivers him from all of his enemies. And when Abraham got a hold of who God was, he began the tithing principle, sowing unto the Lord, giving his best, and expecting a harvest. Number three, to fulfill the covenant to fulfill the covenant. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. Now, the easier way to say that is if you think that was something. <laughs> Look what's coming. If you like that, you're going to love this. That's what he's saying. Number four. You plant your seed to show our love show our love. Song of Solomon verse eight, or chapter 8 verse 7 Many waters cannot quench love. Now you can give without loving. The world does it every day. But you can't love without giving. And God loved so much that he gave. He gave his only begotten son so that men and women would not perish. I remember years ago I saw the great actress Mary Martin on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. I was just, I was young, and she was, uh, her, her career was waning down toward the end. And uh, she told a story on the program that really touched my heart. She was at that time uh, performing on Broadway in the musical Peter Pan. And uh, of course she was well known around the world. And she told a story. She said one night uh, she received a note in her dressing room from the great uh, lyricist Oscar Hammerstein. Oscar Hammerstein and Richard Rogers wrote some of the great music and lyrics to great musicals like Oklahoma, Carousel, uh, so a number of others. And uh, Oscar Hammerstein was quite a poet and he was dying with cancer. But he loved Mary and he sent a note to her. And the note read, a bell is not a bell until you ring it. A song is not a song until you sing it. Love in your heart was not put there to stay, for love is not love till you give it away. And she tucked it in her costume and performed that night. And when she was finished, a lot of people gathered around her dressing room saying, Mary, Mary, there was something different about you tonight something different about your performance. And she said, I pulled out that note and I read it out loud to them. A bell is not a bell till you ring it. A song is not a song until you sing it. 
Love in your heart was not put there to stay, for love isn't love till you give it away. And she said, tonight, I gave my love away. And that's what God did. He gave his love to a world that seemingly hated him. He gave in the face of all opposition. He gave so that men and women, you and I, would not perish but have everlasting life. Number five. To escape condemnation. You sow to escape condemnation. Malachi 3, the prophet said, you've robbed me. You've robbed me. Even this whole nation. How have we robbed you? You've robbed me in tithes and offerings. And you're cursed with a curse. Now, brother, sister, when you are cursed with a curse, that's condemnation. I don't want any part of that condemnation business. How about you? But remember, he gave the answer. He said, bring your tithe and offering into the storehouse and prove me. Now. Not next week. Now. See if I'll not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so much so there's not enough room to receive it and I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. To escape condemnation. Number six. To spread the gospel. To spread the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9.14 So hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel shall live of the gospel. Now that's really talking about supporting your church and supporting your ministry or, or the ministry of your choice in order that the gospel may be spread throughout the world. Amen. And reason number seven is to enjoy God's blessings. Amen. He wants to bless us. He made it clear he wants to bless us. This morning I shared the story about uh, Peter and the empty and the empty boat and the fishing net and all that went on and the, the change that came into Peter's life and how he had a net breaking boat sinking load but it wasn't long after that that he had another experience with fishing when Jesus told him to go down and cast in a hook didn't even tell him to bait it and the first fish you catch will have money in its mouth I mean Peter had some experience with fishes you know. he had one more remember after Jesus death burial and resurrection he said, I'm going fishing. And Jesus came to the shore in the mist and yelled, have you caught any fish? He said, no. He said, throw your net on the other side. <laughs> and they caught a huge number of fish. Peter said, hot dog, it's Jesus. <laughs> and he came swimming to shore, and Jesus had made breakfast for him. <laughs> so he had a lot of experiences with fish. And Peter was... Uh, the lead disciple, you know. He, he, was the, he was the leader of the pack. But still, he didn't have the information. He didn't have the real teaching. He couldn't really explain to us the guts of it. He took someone else. He took somebody named Paul. Paul was the one who taught us. And apparently, the Apostle Paul taught on the principles of sowing and reaping wherever he went. But only one group, only one church really got hold of it. And that's the church at Philippi. Open your Bible to Philippians chapter 4. Only the Philippians seemed to catch hold of what Paul was saying. But he left us a road map for sowing and reaping. He said in chapter 4 verse 13, I can do. I like to call him Paul's can. Paul was God's can-do man. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Now skip down to verse 19. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now that scripture is one of the most quoted scriptures in the Bible. And so is verse 13. People will quote verse 13 and verse 19. But I've got news for you. Without verses 14 through 18, it's not worth a plug nickel. You're just whistling in the wind. If all you do is say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, and my God will supply all my need according to his riches and glory, you're just kidding yourself. 
It's a wasted breath to say it. Unless you do what's in the middle. When I have a sandwich, I don't like to have bread and bread only. With nothing in the middle. I want some meat. I want some lettuce. I want some tomato. I want some onions. I want some mustard and ketchup. I lost some of you. I want the kind that you have to unhinge your jaw to get it in your mouth. A Dagwood sandwich. I don't like to eat bread sandwiches. The nourishment is on the inside. And the nourishment is between 13 and 19. And if you don't carry out 14 through 18, you're just whistling in the wind. Paul said, notwithstanding, you have done well that you did communicate with my affliction. And affliction is not sickness. Affliction is a reference to his need. You've done well that you communicated with me concerning my need. Well, what was Paul's need? Paul's need was to spread the gospel. Now, you've got to understand the background. Paul is writing this letter from jail. He's in prison in Rome when he writes this letter. He's in a little two-by-four jail. He said, notwithstanding, you've done well that you did communicate with my need. Now, you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I was called into the ministry, when I departed from Macedonia, no church, listen to that, no church, not one church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. They were the only group that got it. Apparently, he taught it wherever he went, but nobody else got it and did something about it except the church at Philippi. The church at Corinth didn't do it. The church at Ephesus didn't do it. The church in Galatia didn't do it. The church in Rome didn't do it. Only the church at Philippi. He said, you only, you're the only church that did this. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again. And in the Greek, once and again is translated, you sent again and again and again and again. It was a continual sending. Continual sending. You sent again and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift. Now that's where the rubber meets the road. I know there have been some charlatans out there who seem to be in it for themselves and in it for the money. But you can't say that's the truth in the lives of most every minister. That's not true. He said, not that I desire a gift, and that's how we honest, true ministers feel. We're not trying to get something from you. We're trying to get something to you. Amen. Not that I desire a gift, but I desire fruit, yes. blessing yes. that may abound to your account. Yes. Do you have an account? Yes. Do you have an account with God? Yes. Well, is it empty? <laughs> you know, if you're going to write a check on an account, you better have something in the account. Because if you don't, they put you in jail. You can't write bad checks. But I have all, he said. Now he's in prison. He said, I, I, I've got everything I need. I'm abounding in jail. Having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you. Now he's going to describe their giving. He said, your giving has an odor of a sweet smell. Think about that. Their giving had a sweet smell. Have you ever smelled money? Anybody got a dollar bill? Anybody got a dollar bill? Here's one. You got a dollar bill? Oh, you got one. I got one. Take that one you got in your hand. Smell it. Doesn't smell very good, does it? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you, know why, you know why it doesn't smell good? Because it's been handled. People have touched it. Sickness and disease can be transferred by money. The police will tell you that there's a trace of cocaine on $20 bills. It's come as drug money. People have handled it. 
And when you handle cash, you want to wash your hands. And someone would say, well, that's why, that's why Paul called it filthy lucre. Is he double-minded? How can he say it has an odor of a sweet smell and filthy lucre at the same time? He wasn't talking about money. He was talking about the filthy way in which some people use their money. And people have taught that money is the root of all evil. But that's not what the Bible says. The love of money is the root of all evil. That's why he could call it filthy lucre on one hand and a sweet smell in money on the other. He said their money had a sweet smell. It had an odor of a sweet smell in the nostrils of God. An odor of a sweet smell. And the second thing he said was, it is a sacrifice acceptable. I shared with you this morning, the first murder in the world happened over a sacrifice. Cain killed his brother Abel because Abel's sacrifice was accepted and his was rejected. And Cain got mad and killed his brother over a sacrifice, over a seed. But he said, your sacrifice is acceptable. When you give to God, don't you want him to accept it? You don't want him to throw it back at you and say, this doesn't mean anything to me because it doesn't mean anything to you. No. You want him to say, yes, I receive this. I accept your seed, your sacrifice. So he's saying it's it's a, a it is a an odor in the in the a sweet odor in the nostrils of God. It is a sacrifice acceptable, and then he caps it off by saying it is well pleasing to God. And if you look up Hebrews eleven six, it says that uh, uh, what does Hebrews eleven six says? Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. All right, listen, without faith, it's impossible to please him. He said their giving was well-pleasing. Now listen, the light bulb's going to go on in somebody's mind right now. That means that their faith was attached to their giving. And that's how the term seed faith came into being. And that's what the critics came against. That's what the denominational world came against. And I grew up in all of that. And I know every critical word that's ever been said and written because I've seen it. But God said it is a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing, uh, an odor with a sweet smell, well-pleasing to God. Then and only then could Paul say, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. It took the Apostle Paul to teach us that. Peter couldn't do it. It took Paul. And he laid the road map for us so that every time we sow a seed, we attach our faith to it. And then with our mouth, we call it what it is. And we don't disparage it. We don't decry it. We don't talk bad about it. We don't doubt in our hearts, but we believe that that seed is being sown in good ground. And that it will produce a harvest. And then we shift gears. When I was 14, my, da my mother's dad, Ira Feinstock, taught me how to drive his old 1954 Bonneville Pontiac. And it, uh, it was manual shift. Not on the floor, but on the column. And uh, in order to go, you had to pull forward and go down to come to first. And you had to go up and out and over to get to second. And you had to pull straight down to third. Three-speed manual. And you went in the middle, in neutral, and up to reverse. You had three forward gears, one reverse gear. And my grandfather got me behind the wheel out on the country road. I was just 14. And he showed me how to use that clutch and how to let the clutch out simultaneously as I was in gear and how to start moving forward. And you know the first few times you did it, you 
car would sputter, but, but the more you did it, the smoother you could get into you, until finally you just go, mm -hmm. you know? And we go a little ways, and you could hear the engine whining, and my grandfather would say, now, son, shift gears. Shift gears. And I learned how to shift gears in the second, and I learned how to shift gears in the third, <coughs> high gear. And when you plant your seed, you shift gears. Amen. You don't talk about your seed anymore. Amen. You don't go down and dig it up out of the ground and see if it's growing. Yeah. Now, you shift gears and you look to the harvest. Yeah. You start talking about the harvest. Yeah. You don't talk about the seed anymore. Right. You don't talk about the place you planted it. Right. No, you look to the harvest. Yeah. Every time you plant a seed, you shift gears. You say, now Lord, I'm looking for my harvest. As I grew up, our telephone would ring and my mother would say, is this my miracle? A doorbell would ring. She'd go to the door. Is this my miracle? A letter would come in the mail. Is this my miracle? She was looking. She was expecting. She wasn't looking at the seed anymore. She was looking to the harvest. We've got a great work to do, my friends. There's a world out there that's sighing and dying and crying and going to hell in a handbasket. We've got a job to do. And we're not going to get it done inside these four walls. But what you get here prepares you for what's outside these four walls. Because this is not a parking lot. This is a filling station. This is where you come and you get filled so you can go out there where the need is. This is not about you or for no more. This is about out there where it's tough sledding. He said this gospel shall be preached as a witness to all people on this earth and then shall the end come. We don't have any business being concerned about the end times until we get this job done. Until this gospel is preached to every person on this earth. You have no need to be concerned about the Antichrist. You have no concern whatsoever about who he is or when he appears because the Bible says he cannot appear. He cannot appear until the church has been removed. Before there has ever been destruction in the world, God has always removed the righteous. Before he started the flood, he removed Noah and the righteous. Before the destruction of, of Egypt, he removed the Israelites. And God will do what he's done. You don't need to be concerned about the Antichrist, his identity. The world's talking about the Antichrist, trying to figure out, is he born yet? Who cares? Whenever he is, whoever he is, I'll be watching him from heaven. I'm not going to be worried about him. I got a job, and that's to evangelize the world. To bring salvation to people in need. That's not just my job. He said, you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Don't leave it to me. Don't leave it to your pastor. Get out there and do it. Be a witness. Yes, Typical Christian has never led a person to Christ in their life because they're intimidated. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to say. They're not taking the time. They know how to read the newspaper, but they don't know how to read the Bible. Get the scriptures. Well, how do I lead somebody to Christ? First of all, tell them what Jesus means to you. And ask them the question, would you like to believe on him? You'd be shocked what people will say. Yes, I'd like to believe him. Can I pray for you to receive Christ as your Savior? You'll be shocked. Some may turn you down, but I got news. Some turn Jesus down too. We got a job to do. Don't be worried about the end times. Don't be worried about nation rising up against nation. Jesus said all these things are going to happen. Don't be worried about pestilence and plague and all that. It's all going to happen. It's happening now. It's not anything new. That's not our focus. Our focus is on him, and our focus is on getting the job done. 
I could care less about the Antichrist. Now, if you don't know the Lord, you're going to have a real problem. I mean, you're going to have a real problem. You're going to be standing there on that day jumping saying, yeah, take me. First Thessalonians makes it clear. He'll come in the clouds with a trumpet and with a shout. And he'll say, come up here. And you and I will be out of here. Now, I don't know uh, if, uh, if I'm going up on the, on the load that's uh, uh, alive or if I'll be coming up out of the grave brushing my, the dirt from my hair. I don't know. I'm not in charge of that agenda. You know, the Bible says the dead in Christ will rise first. And if I have already died, I'll come up brushing the dirt out of my hair. Or if I'm alive, I'm going to go caught up, be caught up in the air. But I can tell you, I'm going on the first load. And I'm not going until then. i got a job to do. I'm about my father's business. Are you about your father's business? We are to be witnesses. And he told us where? Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Jerusalem represents your home. Judea represents the places you go. Samaria represents the places where it's hard. And you all know some hard places. And you've got some hard family members. You've got some in-laws and some outlaws. And then the uttermost parts of the earth. I'm doing my part. Are you doing yours? And you're not going to be able to do it without finances. T.L. Osborne said, used to say to me, Richard, if you can't get the money, just forget it. The gospel is free, but it sure takes a lot of money to put it on TV. I have some experience in that. In that. It takes a lot of money to operate missions and to send materials and to do tablets to India and all these things. It, 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 it costs. It costs, but it's worth the investment life of a soul so precious so valuable and I thank God for it and I thank God tonight for an opportunity to pour this into you and I'm praying that it sticks it gets inside you and if necessary changes your thinking so that every time you sow you shift gears and you look to the harvest and you call that which is not as though it is. Hallelujah. Say, Father, I have sown this seed. And in the authority of Jesus' name, I'm calling in my harvest. Yes. No devil, no demon in hell is going to steal my harvest. Devil, you take your hands off of my harvest. Lately, I've been dispatching my angels. I've been telling my angels to go and pick up the harvest that I've commanded the devil to drop. Every day I said, devil, you take your hands off my harvest. And angels, my angels, I didn't lose my angels just because I grew up. I command my angels to go and pick up that harvest and bring it to me for the work of the gospel around this world. And I praise God for it. It's not, it's not impossible. Because he said all things are possible. Praise God. Do you receive that tonight? Do you get it? Yes, sir. Do you take it in? Yes. Will you operate in it? Yes. Will you do it? Yes, sir. Hallelujah, then I'm through. <laughs> Come on, give the Lord a shout tonight. Pastor. <laughs> Praise God. Now, tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning, we're going to deal with angels, and we're going to deal with uh, the sevenfold armor of God. You know, we're not going to a picnic. We're in a battle, and you don't wear, uh, you know, you don't wear gym shorts to a, to a battle. A lot of Christians are going out of their homes each day without much on, spiritually speaking. They don't have on their helmet of salvation, their breastplate of righteousness, their belt of truth, their gospel shoes of peace, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the devil, and they're not praying in tongues, which is the seventh piece of the armor. Not six, there's seven pieces. We're going to deal with that in the morning. Don't miss in the morning. And then tomorrow night, hallelujah, Holy Ghost blowout. Pastor.